Hi there. Gabby just told me that we got to do a video today. I forgot <laughs> for tomorrow. And you know, I thought, well, what am I gonna, what am I gonna talk about today? Um, and I decided to talk about what I've been doing, which is, you could label it the second half of any cycle. Okay, I know that sounds strange, but the overall perspective of this entire uh, life that I'm leading has to do with hopefully, eventually, helping humanities to switch from a linear view of time to a cyclical view of time. And um, I know lots of cultures have that natively, like the more the Eastern cultures, but our Western culture, especially since the advent of science, has been deliberately, I would say, dumbed down to see time as a line going from, from some beginning to some end. And, um, <clears throat> you know, what if that isn't true? What if everything is always moving in circles? That, of course, lets in reincarnation because you didn't just begin your life at birth. Uh, this comes, you come from a long history of all sorts of things going on is what that implies. So uh, I just want to say that uh, this particular uh, talk is going to be wide ranging because I'm trying to get something across that's pretty abstract and yet I want to use a number of concrete examples to get it across. And um, the second half of any cycle is um, very problematic for people in our culture, in the Western culture, because we are schooled to want to be eternally young. Okay, so in other words, always stay in that first cycle as much as you can. Go to the go to thirty, in other words. So that's interesting. Go to thirty. Now, how do we get that? Well, look at it astrologically. That's the Saturn cycle. That's the first cycle of Saturn. Is twenty nine and a half to 30 years long. And so we instinctively know that that's, that's actually the end of a cycle. It's the end of, of childhood, you might say. And the beginning of real responsibility starts at about 30 and goes for another 30 years, which is the second Saturn cycle. And then at 60, it closes down again. And then you have the third cycle of Saturn, which our culture has completely ignored or denigrated or both. And, uh, so I would like to see us start to look at that third cycle in a completely different manner um, so that we can once again reintroduce wisdom into this culture because we worship knowledge and wisdom has been completely ignored. Wisdom does not come by a recitation of memorization of any number of facts. It has to do with learning from experience. And how do we learn from experience we go through cycles and we recognize the at the end of a cycle that we were in one. Sometimes, or we should, sometimes we won't recognize it until the very next time it starts again. Or maybe we won't recognize it until the end of that cycle. Often I'm talking about here are patterns in relationship. We have cycles of relationship, you know, you know, a lot of people say, well, I was with him for two years, or I was with her for two years, and then it ended. Sometimes it ends abruptly when it's two years, because two years is a Mars cycle, and that usually is the cycle of, of hot sex, you might call it. That's the beginning of any um, cycle with that primary relationship usually is hot sex, and that's Mars. And once it, once it completes its, its first um, cycle, then even the sex changes. Uh, the relationship changes because sex is no longer driving the relationship the way it was before. Okay, so where am I going? I'm going to talk about the second half of the cycle. So the personal, I've already mentioned that. Any person has to deal with that. The fact that after 30, you're basically going downhill, even though you're starting a new cycle, you're going downhill in terms of what people think is young. And um, certainly by 60, with the second cycle completing, um, you know, you're, you're, quote, over the hill, and it's so funny, I live on a uh, street that's called Overhill, which I just love, I love that fact, but anyway, so now, I, I want to get into my personal 
um, cycle here that I'm working with right now. Uh, but first I want to give you two more that are really interesting to me. Um, one is uh, the second half of any interpersonal cycle, especially one that's longer than two years. Um, one or not necessarily, it could be one year. In fact, some cycles, some people have cycles with a, an individual, say a primary relationship, which is so energetic, there's so many changes that happened so quickly that it feels like it, it lasted forever, even though it was only a year long. So you never know what, what's going to be what in a cycle. But in any case, if you can consciously experience the cycle, especially when it starts to turn so that the ending is in view, or maybe just unconsciously there and you're starting to recognize it, then you can start working with it in a very different way than before. And I will probably be doing, um, you know, a few, of, a few of these Chromecasts on different relationships I've had, especially the second half of them, to show you what I'm talking about in terms of how to actually do a cycle consciously all the way through, or at least attempt to do that. And when we do that, the fullness that comes in is an extraordinary thing. And because we're no longer looking at time as a line, a linear line, which goes from beginning to end, and that's the end of it, instead we're seeing every relationship we have in terms of its cycle. Each one has its own purpose, which we are meant to find out what it is. Okay, and then one other big one that I just want to mention before I go back to the one I'm in right now, and that is the fact that we also have these gigantic cycles um, that are more collective in nature, generational, having to do with um, nations and their histories and so forth, and cycles of both singular planets and relationships of one planet to another. For example, right now, the United States is in the initial stages, the beginning of a cycle, a new cycle, having to do with the relationship between Saturn and Pluto. They conjunct one another, or Saturn, I should say, goes back to Pluto every 35 years or so. So this is the beginning of a new cycle. They are conjunct right now. They have been conjunct since January. All this year, we're going to be um, recognizing that this is, this is, this seems like the end, but it's actually the beginning. And that will become much more clear as, as time goes on. But meanwhile, let's look back to the second half of the cycle we were just in. Okay, so it's at the 35-year cycle. Well, guess what? These two planets, the half cycle of the, of the relationship between these two planets, of Saturn opposite Pluto, was 9-11. Okay? 9-11. We have been undergoing the second half of the Saturn-Pluto cycle that started in about 82-83. I'm not going to talk about the initial conditions of that cycle, but I'm just going to talk about the fact that the actual culmination of that cycle, in terms of opposition then, was in 2001. Uh, and, and actually the exact time was in August, right before it happened. But I just want to point this out for a minute. Let's see if you can see what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a, a circle here. And then, okay, so look at this. In the United States chart, it has a Sagittarian ascendant and a Gemini descendant. So this is where the, rela where the relationship between the, the nation and the world takes place is right at the horizon, right the horizontal level. And during that time, transit Pluto, which has a 248 year cycle, extremely long, has never been around fully once yet for this nation, was right on the ascendant of the chart, okay? So we were due for some kind of giant um, event, at least one, which had to do with uh, power. Uh, and so, and then of course we had the, the Patriot Act soon after, which again, having to do with power and how do you use power 
And then, of course, we started to go into Afghanistan and we planned for Iraq and so forth. It became a, a um, excuse to uh, use power in a very uh, destructive manner. And at that time, which is a much shorter cycle, Saturn was right here, right here at the opposite place. Okay, so now they've moved so that they're both in the next sign, which is Capricorn. And so we're in the initial stages of something completely different. But we, it would really behoove us to look back between 9-11 and now to say, how have we done this second cycle, or the second half of this, of this cycle starting in 1981, 82, 83? How have we done it as a nation? Um, notice what happens to you when you go to an airport. Notice how all the surveillance is there for everyone now. Um, there's all sorts of things you can notice that feel powerful and not pleasant. And, um, you know, this is, I'll be saying a lot more about that as we go on. But let's go back now and talk about the second half of a cycle that an individual experiences namely me. And um, so I'm 77 years old. And for the last couple of years, I have been periodically engaged in what I call my recapitulation project. I know that sounds very strange. But it's I'm, I'm recapitulating my life. Um, so you have this long cycle of the life. And then any shorter cycle, there's a parallel between there's always this in any cycle. There's always the cross in the circle, no matter how big or how small the cycle, okay? So I'm looking at my entire life, especially starting in my 20s, until now, as seen through, as experienced through the medium of language because I'm a writing fool, and I have been all this time. I used it especially to document my own process. As somebody said, it was a Proustian endeavor, that, and that's true. And especially documenting my own process during times when I was having relationships which were difficult, because that's how I would try to take charge at least of my life. And of course, I was trying to control every man, too, and that never worked, which is so great to find out. And now that I'm going back into my recapitulation projects, process, I've got all of this stacked material, both from journals and from the, the literally probably 400 essays that I've written, some of which have been collected into, you know, they will be collected into ebooks um, and then offered individually as well. And uh, this is a long term project, it's not easy to do. It puts me back into my memories every time I, I go back and I remember, oh my God, what was that like with that guy, that poor guy? That's what I usually think. <laughs> that poor guy, you know, what I was trying to do to him. Always trying to make somebody into a mirror of myself, which is absurd. So at 77, I can look back now and laugh at most of my male-female relationships. Not all of them, but most of them, because they had to do with Anne trying to control the other. And it's a huge teaching for me, obviously, in this lifetime to realize that I cannot do that. And I certainly didn't know it in the first half of my life. And in this second half, hopefully I am learning that. And yet, what I've found about from this inner, inner this relationship business that I've been probing uh, through my journals and through the essays, essays I've written and so forth, um, I have, that's been my great teaching. That's been the teaching I've needed to learn. It's also been my teaching because what's interesting to me is the relationship between individuals to form a bond and how to do that without each, every one of the individuals leaving, you know, just to be to make themselves more attracted to the other person or to um, have a dream of the other person that isn't real or to, um, you know, want to just go lockstep and have them lockstep in your own direction. All these ways that we don't allow the individuals to be themselves. And then what is cooperation then? It isn't cooperation, it's codependency or it's just constant fighting. Uh, or it's periodic fighting. 
So all of these, all of these ways that we have with each other are uh, problematic, um, and especially problematic now in this country, if you'll notice, between the left and the right, or between the, you know, the neoliberal, neoconservative, and the, and the Trumpians, and uh, I mean, all of it, everybody ha is supposedly living in the same world, and yet we are as if we're not living in the same world because we see the world so differently even if we're looking at the same thing we're looking at it in a completely different way and um, so this whole business of individuals and how they form communities and whether they can actually do it whether they can actually cooperate is the main thing that we're all having to learn here um, certainly in this um, period of history but me too in my own life and what strikes me about my own life is because I have been a writing fool, I've been documenting so much that I can go back now and look and see. For example, there was one period of my life where the kinds of things I was writing, I never wrote them like that again at any other time. And all I can say about them is that they are totally pretentious. Okay, the writing I did then was totally pretentious. Then I go back and I go, okay, well, when was that? What was going on? And that was when I had been fired from New College, which is this experimental college that um, had hired me a year before and then fired me for being too experimental, which they really had to do. I should tell that story sometime. But at any rate, um, I was so full of anger and pride and ego and fury that I was writing these weird things. And I would say the good thing about what I was writing is I was really experimenting a lot with language and with rhythm, with tone, with flow. But um, what I was saying was totally nonsense and pretentious. I mean, I was pretending that it made, made sense, but it didn't. And I, I think even back then I probably knew at some level that it didn't make any sense. But that's the only time I've done that. So that I would say it's the only time, at least so far, that my ego took over and um, just dr drove what was happening in the words. Uh, normally, it's, it doesn't take over. Instead, what happens is um, the part of me that is larger than my ego, is larger than my this small self that I operate with in the world, does come through sometimes, and that's what all those essays are, are about. So... Um, I sat there, I, I, one day I remember sitting there, I was with all these things, I was going, Jesus, there's just so much, how can I possibly, how can I possibly organize this, which is what I want to do, and, um, but then I started to recognize the riches that are there, I, I, it's like I have my own personal library that I, I don't even like to use the word I, whoever was this thread of meaning that operated through time, created this ongoing process which has many cycles within it. And I get to investigate it again and how that um, interacts with who I am now and where I'm going. So, you know, they say that at the end of the life, one does, you know, go through one's life and, and you, memories become very important. And it's definitely important here because I'm trying to understand myself as much as I possibly can before I leave here and I'm trying to utilize my life, utilize the, the gleanings I've had from my old life, from my long life to share with others too as much as they would want to pick up on it because very few people have had the leisure, have had the um, drive and have had the maybe the capacity for thinking um, on lots of different planes at once and um, to be able to do this, to be able to have this incredible corpus of, you know, what was what I was going, what was going on in my life at a certain time, and how I was processing it, and how I was framing it up, and um, that is just such an incredibly rich feeling. Now that I'm feeling the recapitulation project in a more, uh, I mean, I'm beginning to feel the richness of it. The fullness that I feel in my life now is just overwhelming. I have never felt so full. And it's so amazing at the second half of one's life that one can start to feel that intense fullness that comes from a life, I don't know if it was well-lived, but it was certainly passionate, 
and it was certainly um, revelatory. How do you say that? Revelatory. Uh, it was full of revelation over and over again, often the same one. Uh, and that I've been, so I go back through these old, old essays, which had, probably half of them were published in various places and half of them weren't because I just keep writing. I just keep going. I can't stop myself. It's showing up now in the exopermaculture blog where I'm responding to events more than I am doing my own, you know, responding to my own life, though sometimes I am. But this is the nature of who I am, and I would like to collect all of this and put it on its own website, along with the book that I wrote, um, This Vast Being, and have them as collections uh, into ebooks. And then just a few days ago, I realized, well, no wonder I'm bogged down. I need to put this entire project into an Excel spreadsheet. So I started to do that, and I've gotten now to 236 essays. And I'm saying these are the essays that are worth something. You know, the pretension I'm not putting in there. Um, but, and I bet you I have another 150 to go. Um, it's just unreal. My output is absolutely unreal. But the point is, it's the second half of this cycle that I'm in, the long lifetime cycle. And I'm in the second half also of the third Saturn cycle, which began just about the time that I uh, started this process of recapitulating. The second half of the third cycle of Saturn started when I started this process of recapitulation. So I, I really... Um, urge everyone to start thinking in terms of cycles. You know, ask yourself, well, how, what was that? How long did that last? Um, and how do I see the entire process? How, how can I process the entire thing to complete it and to not just complete it, but to incorporate it as wisdom within my own being, especially the second half of any cycle? Because usually if there's expectations, if there's big expectations in the first half, then there's usually if it's ending, big disappointments in the second half. On the other hand, if we can do it consciously, then instead of that, it feels like whatever you were meant to do with that person, you did. There was some kind of soul contract that you had with that person that you have finally completed because you did the ending consciously. Well, uh, uh, Gabby just convinced me that I should probably um, show a few of these examples of pretension and maybe talk about pretension and ego in the next uh, podcast. So I'll do that because, um, hell yeah, why not? <laughs> okay, thanks, bye.